Why is this not the base case scenario, 100 bucks a barrel? Well, our base case is $78 uh, for Q4 um, of this year. And, and that's based on, on our supply-demand balances that we work on very closely. But one thing that became very clear uh, just uh, uh, coming out of APEC week in Singapore last week is that a number of market participants are talking uh, quite actively about $100 oil in Q4 of this year or Q1 of next year. And one of the things that we did is, uh, is we tried to analyze whether that would be statistically possible for one thing, um, just basis, star, uh, basis positioning analysis, basis flow dynamics and so on. And what we found out is that if we just go back to the beginning of this year when we had around 500,000 uh, barrels of speculative length in the WTI market held by what are called money managers, we're now about 150,000 uh, barrels less than that now. We've got about 350,000. So if we were simply just to, if they were just simply rebuy those 150,000 contracts uh, and, and, and doing some analysis uh, that we've done behind the scenes, something called a shapely O and decomposition to try and try and understand exactly how many lots or futures contracts mm. a speculator needs to buy to move the price of oil by one dollar, we, we ended up with a number of 8,000. Um, so if we divide those two out, we end up with a $19 um, a potential move in prices, which takes us very close to $100. We then went to look at how quickly have they historically done this. And the fastest time in history where speculators, and, and I stress just speculators, have been able to add 150,000 barrels of oil has been 17 weeks, which interestingly takes us right to the end of uh, January of next year. So it's certainly technically possible, um, but to be very clear, it's not our base case scenario. Um, this is a, an upside risk scenario born out of the confluence of supply driven shocks that we, we, we might run into um, in Q4 of this year centered around the Iranian sanctions, the loss of uh, the loss of spare capacity from OPEC and of course mm. all these pipeline bottlenecks in the U.S. Yeah, Mark, David here in, in Hong Kong. So, I mean, essentially what you're saying is the market now has all the information it needs and we're properly priced at about 85 bucks uh, on Brent. What needs to happen, just theoretically speaking, what needs to happen for us to sustainably move above 90 and towards 100 bucks? The thing that needs to happen is we need greater compliance. We're factoring in about 1.3 million barrels of loss from Iran as a function of the sanctions. If we get anything more than that, um, that will kick prices higher. If we get greater than expected declines out of Venezuela, we're expecting about 50,000 barrels a month. If we get more than that or indeed any other supply outages around the OPEC, uh, around the OPEC world, that will also contribute to it. And, and we're relying quite heavily um, on, on shale oil. Remember, shale has always been this, this sort of force in the market that set a ceiling. And it's certainly been the case for the last few years. And all we've, all we've really had to understand is what price do we need to get oil to in order to bring all this extra shale oil onto the market. At the moment, you know, the U.S. shale industry has localized itself into the Permian Basin. And they've run into problems now because the pipelines needed to take the oil from the, ship, from the Permian down to the Gulf Coast and out of the U.S are at capacity. So if we run into any problems with, with, with that or further problems, if we don't build the pipelines quickly enough, we expect them in the second half of 2019, collectively all these variables will add, in our view, about 15 to, 15 to $20 of upside. Those are our sort of geopolitical risk, supply outage, risk limits that we wrap around our base case scenario. So, so we've seen kind of a bit of this gap when it comes to WTI and Brent right now and that, that discount that WTI has, has started to widen a little bit. Do you think that that could actually widen further or do you think we could start to, to narrow a bit from here? We think it's going to narrow. We're suggesting to our clients to buy that spread, meaning go long TI and short Brent. Uh, that, that, that also dovetails nicely with the positioning profile in the market. But we, we, we're, we're advising them to have a very tight stop loss behind that. So it's around $9 TI at a discount to Brent at the moment. We expect it to converge to around $5. Um, but if it breaks $11, um, then we advise getting out of it. So it's a, it's a, it's a reasonably high risk trade, a sort of a double your money um, on it. And it's based on the resumption <laughs> and the building of the pipelines to drain that inventory out um, of the U.S. Uh, if there are any problems with that, remember when WTI and Brent blew out to around $25 uh, before TI had a discount to Brent, that was linked to pipeline issues in the United States. So they do have a very powerful sway on that spread and they need, uh, we need to watch that very closely.
And Mark, very quickly, you talked already a little bit about some of your top trade recommendations, uh, Brent and West Texas here. So, uh, buy silver, sell gold. That ratio falls to 71. Why? Historically, it's never been at levels where it is now. Um, it's, uh, we had put that, we advised that trade when the ratio was around 84, 85. It's since fallen um, quite a lot since then. It still has some way to go, in our opinion. Um, we, 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 we favor silver above gold. I mean, silver is an industrial metal at the end of the day, so it does have some use mm. um, in the economy. It's very closely linked to copper, which we see upside uh, in that as well. So we're, we're supportive of silver prices from here. And gold Gold, frankly, um, we expect potentially a little bit of a bounce as a function of short covering. The positioning in gold is extreme. There's a very large short position. Furthermore, these short positions are very likely held by a few number of traders holding a very large position, which tends to, tends to pave the way for quite a violent short covering rally. Um, but, but despite that, we, we feel that silver outperforms gold over the medium term um, with the interest rate uh, outlook and the rate profile on the horizon weighing on gold, um, lackluster safe haven demand weighing on gold, poor physical demand weighing on gold. It really has suffered a lot um, over the last uh, few years. So we expect silver to outperform gold and hence buying that ratio.